um, it's actually very hard to get a picture um, of the mound itself um, to actually show. And what you're actually looking at here is the ruins and the covering that barely covers the top. It, it meets it. So in fact, if we look at the mound, it's actually continued at that same height, and that's not its original height. So that's the first thing that we have to say, is that this mound is much smaller than it actually was in its um, true form. So this is the very beginning of a very, very long-term project. This is like my magnum opus, I would say, for New Smyrna archaeology. This is um, multi-year because it's a multi-component archaeological site. What we mean by that is that it has multiple different um, lifeways. So prehistoric, early historic, the colonial, then we have territorial, we have two wars that go on right here at the mound. Um, we have Seminole War, we have Civil War, and then we have the earliest pioneers who come back and actually found the city of New Smyrna. Oh, and I left out, of course, the thing that I'm really interested in, and that's the Turnbull Colony, right? So we have all these different iterations, and they all exist on this one site in some form or fashion, not totally um, like a huge um, component, some of these, but it's still there. So it's nice to know that um, when the city saved this property and this is an archeological site, it truly is the center of our community and it always has been. So that's something to, to really hone in on. The other thing is that we're talking, oh, just 2,524 years, give or take a few. I mean, that's a long history. A lot longer than you and I have been around or will be around. So there's a lot to really learn still. It's a listed National Register of Historic Places site, which gives it, of course, protection. It asks for the monitoring of any kind of land disturbance. That's where I come in. And of course, study. We want to know more about this resource always. Project one that started this whole process of studying the mound um, came because of a multi-year utility upgrade by the NSB Utility Commission. Because they're on um, city land, they're required to have an archaeologist present for all the ground disturbing activities. So this portion of the project was a wide ranging pipe replacement for all utilities on the beach side. So you're welcome. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I stood and smelled things that I shouldn't smell, mm -hmm. um, but actually my dad was in this kind of construction work, so I appreciate it. Um, and the next phase of this project will actually be to replace the lift station that's currently next to the Coquina Foundation. So that's about two years from now, so I'm very excited about that too. That means more, more. So um, my part of this project, though, was to monitor the excavation and the ground disturbances with the big yellow shovels, I call them, um, to make sure that nothing critical was missed, as well as to accurately document the type of work and disturbances that it would cause, because it's going to cause disturbance. Um, and my own research goals included to recover a much, as much archaeological data as possible so that I could compare them to the other project that I would be working on. And this is the other project. This is the one that's taken 30 years to get to. Not for lack of trying. I'm, I'm not for lack of trying. <laughs> um, this is the WPA wall restoration, or what I call the South Mound, because it's south on the property. <laughs> um, and this wall, in fact, has, um, because if you know anything about Coquina, Coquina is a very porous shellstone, and it... Um, it, it, it breathes maybe a little bit too much as a sedimentary stone, so it can cause these huge cracks when water infiltrates. And when you're dealing with a resource like a shell mound where there's lots of cracks in the actual substrata, you're talking about a lot of heaving with moisture content. So basically what we did is we actually put in a French drain behind the wall. Um, and they just removed the fencing today. Today, <laughs> so you can see all of the reconstruction work that um, we did on the back side of the mound. It's grassed over and everything quite nicely. It took six months to just dig a couple feet behind the wall all the way down to the base of the wall and to um, work on that, that engineering feat. So 
So one of the things that we also have to kind of consider here when we're dealing with a mound is, is it a mound or is it a midden? Maybe you've heard those terms before. Middens usually indicate organic growth. It grows accretionally over time. We all deal with one thing in life, garbage, right? We have to figure out what to do with all the trash that we create. And humans from time immemorial have dealt with their garbage. And how you deal with it um, says a lot about you actually, and archeologists are just modern day uh, ancient trash collectors, right? And I look at every single piece of trash and I get excited about it. <laughs> Who knew, right? Um, it's important for us to understand how things actually happen um, on a day-to-day -day basis so we can kind of understand, okay, what were the forces that brought this shell mound into being? And I, I love this, these are illustrations by um, Theodore Morris, they're not mine, I am not that talented. Um, but I, I felt like I lived in this illustration for six months because being underneath the surface of the mound and having this structure behind me, it was like literally looking at this. I could see sherds in between the shells and here's a fish bone and here's this and here's that. And it was amazing. It was, it was a, it's a unique experience. You don't literally get to get inside of a shell mound very often. Um, but this illustration here is actually showing construction and we do know that in fact in the past people constructed mounds for very specific reasons they were engineering projects they were communal projects anybody built a house here yeah. what's the first thing you want to do foundation. you have to build a foundation and that foundation is usually <laughs> up right same reason they built mounds you want your feet wet you want your house blown away you want your house flooded nope so they built mounds for the very same reason. So this is another illustration that can show you just in a very short period of time how middens, these are the trash piles behind the people's houses, how they can build up just on a you know, day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's very fast. You add in a couple of, well, my house is broken, your house is broken, we had a huge storm, now we need to clean off this whole surface and we need to build it up a little bit higher and you start getting a mound very, very fast. And this is, if we were looking at it and walking into a village, it would look something like this. You would have circular huts, you would have activity areas. This man is um, working shell right here. This is, this is where we get the word barbecue. It's from the Spanish description of this structure right here. It's called barbacoa. And it was um, a smoke structure. It was to smoke fish, to smoke leaves, to smoke palm berries, which supposedly tasted like rot gut. That's what they described them as. Actually, they described them as vomit. Um, it's pretty bad, yeah. Um, but all kinds of different things are going on on the surface and if you're living in it you don't see how these things are building up over time necessarily so the other question that i have as a result of looking at some of this information is what we know about the Timucua is they are what we would call a simple chiefdom they have a headman um, and he is the guy who gets all of the tribute. He is the important guy. He makes the decisions whether they go to war. He calls on his sub-chiefs for help when he needs it. But he is the guy who makes all the decisions. And that guy is at Nogoroko. So um, what we know that the way that these simple chiefdoms are structured is it's based on what it's based on today. Who are you related to? Who are you married to? Right? So it's based on kin groups. So who, who's are who's and who's aren't who's? So what we know is that the noble people, the people that have high status, generally live nearest the chief. Well, what happens when you grow your village and you start marrying people from other kin groups and they can't live with the chief's kin groups, can they? No. So they get pushed off, and in fact, sometimes they get pushed off so much that they actually have to go live somewhere else. So in fact, Caparaca may actually only indicate the village center. 
And some of these mounds that used to exist all over New Smyrna may in fact be parts of the village, just at a distance. So some of these maps should look pretty familiar because they come from on the other side of that wall. And you can see that um, th these are from Smyrna, from the actual settlement maps that um, the British cartographers, do you, can you tell? These are actually mounds. They're showing them as bluffs, though. And in fact, that is how the British um, and even pioneer settlers talk about New Smyrna. It's a shelly bluff. Well, actually, it's not a shelly bluff. We were actually, this whole line of the mainland is a Pleistocene sand dune that then people lived on and made it a shelly bluff. That shell didn't get there by itself. It got put there by generations of generations of humans living on it and bringing their trash. So we have, um, let's see, where am I? This is the Rock House Mound, which is up by, um, the, where the airport is today. So this is on the waterway. And again, two little mounds look like bluffs. This also says, this says Indian Mound. Mount. They call them mounts. This says Indian Mound. Indian Mound. On the map from 1768, 9. This is Delaire's map. This one is what's called probably the Riverside Mounds. And again, Man, look at how long this thing is. And this is described as a long, linear, midden mound. And then there's this mound behind it. Huh, interesting. This is us right here. This is right here as the waterway comes in. And look at this weird, right, bluffy looking thing, right? And then this is at the South Canal. Again, they're showing it as two distinct bluffs. What? What in the world does that mean, right? And then you get all these things. What are these? <laughs> the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but they're definitely showing that there are some structures, and these are the same ones that are indicated here on Bartram survey. This is the one from Del Air. This is up at Murray Creek. This, again, is like the Murray Creek um, area. So there's something going on that, you know, and these are the little rancherias that um, in 1605, Mexia is seeing, and he's talking about them. This is from, this is the colorized map. We don't have those mounds up here, but look, two mounds here and a mound in its shadow. I don't know why it has a shadow, but this one does. Um, and you can see, I mean, it says mounds. <laughs> so these were not created by the British. These were here when the British got here. So uh, they just co-opted them and used them. So this here is here, and this is on the other map. And none of these mountains <coughs> exist at all anymore. They're all gone. So again, as I said, this is the Riverside Mountains. Um, we have artifacts from it. This probably right here was a burial mound. And this is right where US-1 goes through, okay? So, um, but you would never have your burials generally where you lived. You had them reverently um, near you, but you didn't have them usually in the same place where you lived. And you wanted to be as close to the water because we want to be as close to the water. They really wanted to be close to the water because it's called your food source. So, and this is a little blurry just because of the, but in each one of these situations, we have two mounds shown every time. So I'm like, are we the town of two mounds? Like each mound is actually a double mound? Huh. I mean, this is something to really ponder as an archaeologist because no other place has something like this. But yet the British are certainly saying there's this double mound thing kind of going on here. So, I mean, this could be really exciting. Um, and then there's this funny Thing. I've spent a lot of time with my hands up over there taking pictures because it's hanging from the ceiling. This looks like a mound with vegetation growing on it. Again, this would probably be a burial mound. It doesn't take very long for vegetation to just spring up on top of these mounds because they are so rich in um, minerals and um, they've had human-induced soils. Um, they call it 
Terra Prieta and the Amazon, we are nasty creatures. We are animals. We sweat, we cry, all the other things of eating and excreting, they get infused in our soil. And so if you live on the land, that land becomes very greasy, very dark, and trust me, from a woman who has dealt with more midden soil than you will ever see in your entire life, it stinks. It does not come off. It is as black as black can be. And it loves to grow things really fast, which also doesn't surprise me that that may be why the Turnbull Garden is indicated in that same location as the Big Mound. It had the best soil around, so yeah, of course. And this is, of course, the South Canal, the South Canal, which I'm going to be studying the South Canal soon. So the only other um, question in my mind is, it could be one of these really weird mounds. This is not from here. This is from Columbia County, so north of here. But if you'll see, there's this C-shaped or U-shaped midden area, and then there's mounds on top of it. And each one of these is like a kin group. So different families living though within shouting distance, spitting distance, but where you are in that living surface is based on who you're related to again. So at the time that Europeans make contact, and we do have some of this barely accurate history, <laughs> Um, they do tell us an awful lot about the natives that they're meeting. And we do know that these towns, so Caparaca, would include at least these eight structures. The common house, which is round. Noble households, so those are the ones that are set apart and are going to be on mounds. Um, a chief's house, a communal house, or a communal meeting place. A house of food or private food storage structures attached to each little house. So, you know, a closet, <laughs> basically, or, or a lean-to behind your house where you would be storing your food. A barbacoa where you would be smoking your food, drying your nets, things like that. Um, it would have a burial structure, so either a charnel house or a permanent repository like a mound. Um, and then things that people forget about, women's huts for menstruation and for post-childbirth. You have to have a place to put women because they pollute um, the men during those time periods. So they have to have a place apart, which is really where the fun happens. <laughs> All the anthropologists say it's the happening place. <laughs> it's the time that you get to relax. <laughs> um, so this is an example of what these houses look like. And we do know what they look like because the Spanish went into great detail about these houses. So we know that the Tamuqua in general lived in a round structure and they were covered with palm thatching. And palm thatching done right actually is really watertight. Um, and, but it still allows that air to move in and out as well as the smoke, which is very important. But we have to know that these are very short-lived structures, right? Very short-lived. Um, big hurricane comes, bye-bye, <laughs> right? A big storms like we've had that are extra tropical, non-tropical, or non-tropical hurricanes. You guys remember those, in, like the one we had in November and December? The non-hurricane hurricane that was worse? Oh my gosh, right? It's all gone. So these were very easy to construct with just local materials, but they were also replaceable and would have to be um, a lot of um, replacing and up, regular upkeep for it. So we know that structures are also 25 feet in diameter. They're constructed without windows, so very dark. Um, and the shape of the roof allows that smoke to come out, but keeps the water out. This is something that a lot of people don't realize is that the um, furniture was actually constructed into the wall. There was uh, bed platforms that were around the outside and I love this, a Spanish priest said they're far enough off the ground that a flea can't jump onto you. <laughs> now how descriptive is that, right? Um, and that, and you'll see, even here you see the straw. Well, actually, we, we do have some um, reports that they actually dug little small smudge pits to keep the mosquitoes and the other critters out uh, while they were sleeping. Because if you've ever um, camped in Florida, which this girl has spent a lot of time in tents, 
And let me tell you, there is nothing like scratching all night long for mosquitoes. It sucks. So um, besides their other way of trying to get rid of pests, which included smearing themselves with bear grease and charcoal and all kinds of other unjust things, they did a lot of smudging. So the, yeah, I mean, you smelled like a campfire. That's just, that was the <laughs> ODV everywhere. So um, we also know that a village might include about 15 to 20 houses. That's that's actually a good size family family groupings, um, and they were set about 75 feet apart. This is an example from Jamestown that I visited, and these are reed mats. So these are woven reed mats that are thrown over it. What we know um, from the Spanish is they say that all the pine trees touched, and then they put thatching over it. So the whole thing might have been thatched, or they might have just thatched the top. So we don't really know, but matting like this was um, used on the floors, we know that. Um, all kinds of weaving was done with all the different types of palm and fiber and other rushes that we have here. So this is from the inside, they are very dark. They smell like a campfire um, because of the way that the smoke comes in, but there's stuff everywhere. By the way it's constructed, it's constructed to, to hold all of the things that we don't think about a lot of times. You'll see here, this is the bed platform. <coughs> and again here, here's a, a bed for a married couple. But here's a bed platform, here's your storage, your bookcase, or whatever you may need. So um, we have to ask, too, um, what's missing um, from all of this? Well, there's one last structure I do want to talk about quickly. and. The saddest thing is, is that we don't have any examples of this, except in the historic record. So we have a couple of descriptions. It says that there was a council house at these villages. So not these, just like the little rancheria, little settlements, no, but at the village. So Caparaca had one of these, a council house. It was large, it was round. The chief would meet all of his counselors at the same time inside this thing. And he would receive his salutes, basically his tribute. People would come and make homage. He would discuss village business and drink casina. Has anybody heard of casina? Yopan tea? The Yopan brothers here in town? Okay, casina tea is made from the plant casina. Um, and it is a ritual tea. And it was so important that all of Southeastern culture, especially ritualized noble culture, is based on this tea. It's super important. So we know that, in fact, the chief, where I have that written down, hold on. The chief had the franchise on brewing and serving casina. You couldn't drink it in your own home. It was only to be given by the chief in a community setting. And where you sat in the pecking order literally determined how you would get served your casino. And it's a wonderful drink. If you haven't had it, find some, uh, some Yopan Brothers tea. It's served locally all around town here, so you can find it and try it. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. So what's missing? So we know all this sort of stuff should be here, but when we actually look at what we have, it is nothing like what was here. This is an early postcard, and this is the mound. <laughs> Do you see how large it is? <coughs> yes. Um, this is from the ocean house, and here is the mound. Large. Here is another angle. This is if we were standing at Washington. Okay? This is the important part. It goes almost all the way to the river. Is it there today? No. Nope. All gone. All gone. Don't make me cry about it. But I don't know. Um, we have a description from 1907 from one of our residents who was also trying to be Chamber of Commerce. He was trying to promote... New Smyrna, and he says, the New Smyrna Mound is of considerable extent. It has 20 or more feet in depth. That would mean height, right? And is composed chiefly of oyster and clamshells. 
I can tell you 100% that's the truth. Um, and he says, among which are innumerable fish bones. That is also the God's honest truth. Um, broken pottery is also found. Some of the bowls are of large size. Also correct. Flints, and by that he means chipstone tools, are rare. Also true. So all of those things are, in fact, true. <coughs> So if we go back to our idea of, you know, what are we dealing with here? Well, I'll show you. So here I come, the archaeologist on the spot. This is the um, mound project number one. I do a lot of singing in my head, because maybe that's just me. But I sing um, Alice in Chains down in a hole an awful lot because I tend to be down in a hole an awful lot. Um, and these, these gentlemen that I work with, I'm generally the only female out there, but they're so sweet. They're like, they want to hand me down the ladder. And I'm like, really, I'm okay, thanks. <laughs> I've been doing this a while. So if you think about an iceberg, they say 10% of the iceberg is above the water and 90% is below. It's not that extreme in archaeological sites, but it's, I don't know, 60, 40, 80, what is that, 80, 20, 20. <laughs> 70, 30? I don't know what it is, but there is certainly a lot that is underneath the ground because as I showed you in that little village, you know, you start out on ground surface and the ground grows with you. It's just how we operate. So in this hole right here, Something amazing happens, and yes, this is your new pipe. Mm -hmm. Say hi, pipe. Mm -hmm. This is also your new pipe if you've got water on the beach side. Um, and it's, it's right over here. I've blown it up. And you might be like going, wow, what is that, Rebecca? Well, I got a better picture. So here it is. This is the bottom of the mound. This is the bottom, bottom, bottom. This is four and a half feet underground. Okay? It's 1.4 meters. So, what is it? Well, this is the actual, this is the uh, humic layer. So this is the, this was the ground surface at one time. Does anybody, can any, this is, this is the, you can reply part. Does anybody see what this is? It's clamshells. It is clamshells. Are they different types of clams? No, they're the same species. These are all the same species of clams. There's not an oyster in that layer. <laughs> well, this actually says something. Um, this says that at least the very beginning of this shell mound, they started it just like we would start our own foundation for a house. Bring in all that crushed rock. Bring in all of the, we want the clam shells. Bring us your clam shells. And a whole layer of them gets laid down. It is literally what we would call in archaeology a ritualized or a clean surface. In other words, they're coming in and they're putting all the same down. And that's what we're ritually creating our living platform. This is our living surface now. So, um, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty spectacular. Now what happens, even if something is intended to be a construction, an engineering feat, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have accretional layers. In other words, that midden component where you gotta deal with your trash somehow. And because you're rebuilding your houses all the time and you're eating all of this stuff, yeah, it's gotta go somewhere. So we end up seeing things like this. Um, huge deposits. This is the underground portion. And then this is the, the above ground portion that we have dug into. And this is what I mainly lived in for six months all these blinding white shells. But believe it or not, there's artifacts here, 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 here. I can see them, you probably can't. Um, the guys would be like, I can't believe you see any of that. Because <laughs> they didn't see it at all. And I'm like running up and down you know, these huge hills of shell. Um, but you can see different layers, maybe. Yep, yep, yep. yep. So these are different time periods, potentially, or it can mean a whole bunch of different things. So we go from something that's like this, 
And like this, this is Julia Street. Look at that, it was beautiful, right? They, had, they put this little wall in, another part of the wall. And then what happened, you know, this thing was not always uncovered. It became uncovered in 1901, uh, or 1907, sorry. Um, Dr. Fox decided to start improving the land that he owned, and he uncovered the foundations here. So whether the, the Sheldons had their house and used a portion of it for their basement or whatever, nobody really knew the extent of it and that it was there. They started finding it because they were mining the shell for roads, right? The number one use for shell that you have no use for is for roads, of course. So that's where all of our mound went. It was literally mined, more than half of it was mined for roads. And you know, we can't blame anybody for that. It just is what it is. But if we look at some of these old, old pictures, you'll notice, first of all, there's really old trees growing in the hammock. Again, really, really fertile soil because humans have enriched it for generations. It's got all this good charcoal and all this good yummy stuff in it. So trees grow really fast on it. But you can see that it extended all the way to the river, even to that point. It is not until we get to the WPA. <laughs> when we had too much time on our hands and people needed work. So we made work projects. And one of the work projects was not just let's build a, a retaining wall for our river, but let's retain our mound. So they uncovered the Coquina Foundations. And this is the extent, this is where that wall went. This is the edge of the mount before the wall got put up. And this is another um, early, early picture of some of that strata from when it was being mined. I can't even hardly look at these. They make me want to cry. And of course, now we get to the part that's the fun part. So here I am. I have crates and crates and crates of shell not clam and oyster. I'm not that crazy. But I did bring home <laughs> all of these large shells. And, you know, the, the operators that I worked with, they asked me a lot of times, well, why are you bringing home these shells? Well, there's some good reasons. These are both artifactual as well as eco-facts. An eco-fact is something that occurs in nature. It's not made by humans, but it's transported by humans and used by humans. So an artifact is generally something that we truly create as humans. So eco-facts are things like shells. They didn't show up there on their own, right? No. They were brought by humans. So the most obvious use for all of these very large mollusks, these are carnivorous sea slugs. I love that description, but they are kind of gross. Um, but they were most obviously used for not well. Food! Food! For first, they were used for food. Then they were used for tools. And something that other people don't think about, they were the first dishes. So a lot of these, especially these, these are called boozy cons. They're whelks. They hold quarts of water in them. So they're very good for uh, stew. Fish stew is very prevalent in this time period. Again, here's the food reference, and these are all different kinds of large mollusks. It includes channel whelks, tulip whelks, um, the boozy con, there's a horse whelk right here. Um, you can think of the species, it's there in differing amounts. So this is really important, again, when we consider the fact that casina is a ritual drink, and these are ritual cups, these are two different ritual cups. These are not the same one. One is, this is holding fish bones. This one is holding sludge um, from the mound. Um, it got rained on, so it holds the, holds the, the midden soil there. Um, but these were the ritual cups that Casino was um, served in. So they become pretty important when we start finding lots of these ritual cups in one location, because that could mean 
That's the communal house, right? And then I made another discovery. We've got something else going on here at Caparaca that nowhere else in Central Florida or even Southeast Florida. It's these, and I hate them. <laughs> They're my number one enemy mollusk. They're giant eastern murex, and I hate them because they are very painful when you wash them. Can you see why? Yeah, they're spiky. Now, you should, you maybe have seen these. They're also called, um, they're akin to the lacy murex, where they have those spines, and they're very pretty. Well, you'll notice these things are huge. These are really large, like bigger than my hand. Um, and then I also started noticing, gosh, there's something wrong with these things. They're all knobbly. They, is this? Calcium carbonate that's accreting and, and coming through the mound and actually um, getting on the shell. And I found it is not. It is a co-evolutionary environmental um, thing that's going on here. It's very hard to see in these pictures, I know. But these are coral polyps that have colonized the eastern murex. And they're hitching a ride and making a new coral colony. So I have hundreds of these, and a malacologist, that's a person who studies mollusks, they can actually study this, get a date from the shell, they can look at the coral species, the coral polyps that are growing on this shell, and know something about salinity, temperature, and where in the environment it's living. And these have been locked in the archaeological record and nobody else has them. Mm -hmm. It's pretty exciting. So somehow, Caparaca developed a taste for this stuff. I don't even know what it tastes like. Um, beyond the other mollusks. And 90% of them, I started noticing after you start washing 200, 300, 400 of them, you start to see patterns. And I started to notice a pattern on the top. They all have smoke rings. They have smoke damage. So they were turned upside down, the top was chopped off, they were thrown in the fire and cooked in shell and then eaten. But they're not used for anything else except for escargot. food. What? It escargot. is. It's just like escargot. You're right. <laughs> and then these babies. I have worked at the largest archaeological site in North America and I never, never found shards this big. That's my hand. My hand. That's small hands. Huge shirts. So we're talking big pots. Why do you need big pots? Because you got to make big drinks like Casina for a whole village. So there are some telltale things going on here, I think, at the mound. Even though we're missing more than half of it, I do think that we are able to say something is different here. So whether or not people are living out in the community at a distance, we do know that here at the mound, um, there is something special going on. And this is another example of it. This is an effigy pot. You don't get effigy pots at regular people's houses. This is a little tail. That's what you're looking at in clay. And it's slipped so that the top is dark and the bottom is, is light. Pretty nifty. And then I found this, and I literally almost had a heart attack on the site. <laughs> this is a piece of wood, y'all. Wood hardly ever survives. This is a fire-hardened piece of wood, and it has this neat little knot here. Either it's a natural knot, or it's an enhanced knot, or it's something, but I don't know, it looks like a bird to me. <laughs> and I freaked out, and I sent it to my friend, who was the state archaeologist for a while, and I said, what do you think? And he goes, I don't know, it looks kind of artifactual to me. And I said, me too! So I got very excited. So um, this could be like the biggest find of all, is that I found a piece of wood. <laughs> but it was a piece of wood from really, really, really long ago. And we are missing so much of that kind of material because it just doesn't last. So all the textiles, all of the basketry, all of the wood, which we know were just, they were legend. I mean, they were woodworkers beyond anything we can ever imagine. They made statuary and all kinds of carvings, and we have none of it. So this, that's why I was like, oh, is it a bird? <laughs> Let's hope it really is. So, of course, I know everybody always wants to see the goodies. So I do have a few pictures of goodies. 
I've talked way too long, but I could talk about this for four hours because there's so much. I mean, how do you talk about 2,500 years of history, right? Um, but there are glimmers of the archaeological data matching up with the oral history that we have of the early homes and the early pioneers. One of them is that after um, 1835 and the Seminole War that, that everybody loses their housing here in New Smyrna, when they come back, they scavenge shipwrecks and shipwreck planks and build their houses. And what do you have here? You have two brass ship spikes that hold ship planking together. So that's a pretty good indicator. And then I have four or five of these I found. These are called ballast bottom bottles. And they were, in fact, kept in the bottom of ships early on. And this one dates to 1835. Mm -hmm. It comes from Ireland. Did you know ginger ale was invented in Ireland? Me neither. <laughs> I found that out because of this bottle. So some other historic things, um, this is either a leg for, uh, it's either an andiron for a fireplace or for an oven, it could be a leg, um, a shutter dog or um, a type of closure on a shutter or a door, um, strapping. This of course, I again almost fainted, <laughs> this key is this big, it's pretty special. Uh, this might be an 18th century bottle finish from a bottle of gin. The British like their gin an awful lot, and that's why it's important, because it might be from the Smyrnia colony. And then pottery from all kinds of different time periods. Um, but I've only just begun. And just like my little helper here, this is my archaeology cat, um, she comes and helps me while I wash uh, my artifacts. You too can always get involved because I believe archaeology is for everyone. You can follow me on, on the socials at NSV Archaeology. It's not hard to find me. Um, or you can email me if you're really interested and you want to like get your hands dirty. You can wash artifacts too. Because <laughs> I got pockets of them and I barely started. So you too can find out about what was going on in the past. Please join me in thanking Rebecca. <laughs>